Michael Cox. Um, I'm a part of a, a group that came together with an idea. And a couple of us got together and we thought, you know, we have all these different groups around the island. Why don't we, how can we help advance both climate and energy issues on, on the island? So what we decided to do is we got together five organizations. We got together Citizens Climate Lobby, Climate Action Bay Bridge, which I'm a member of, EcoAdapt, Friends of Island Power, and Sustainable Bay Bridge. And we got together and we started talking about what can we do collectively on the island. So we're not only all these parallel tracks, but we, we, we get together and we talk. So what we decided to do is we decided to get put in a little beer. Of course, you know, beer is the magic elixir of, of ideas. So we had the idea, we had the, the, all the different organizations, we put a little beer in, shazam, came up with something called the Climate and Energy Forum. And what it is, really kind of trying to do two things. On the climate side, you can ask, and I think people in this room are, are familiar enough, but just to remind everybody, why do we care about this? Why do we care about climate change? Well, we care about climate change, and I do, particularly like all of us. It affects every aspect of our life. If it's from infrastructure, from wastewater and drinking water plants, as we've seen in Houston and Florida and Puerto Rico and Sandy and on and on, infrastructure is vulnerable to climate change, particularly along the coastline. And if for those who've worked in the field, this is where those things are built. They're built on the water. That's where they're built. And an incredibly important, as we know, and, and for us. So, built environment, shorelines, forest fires, agriculture, I could go on and on. You know the story. And then humans, that's us. And the impacts on humans. And there's studies that are coming out, and it's been a little slow, to be honest, drawing the link between climate change and human health, but now CDC has come out, the World Health Organization, a number of organizations now have come up the last year and really started to document and identify the, the risk to us, our health, not just here, but around the world from climate change. Also on the energy side, well, what we'd like to do is move from this, a fossil fuel economy, what we'd like to do is move to that. And so that was another driver for this forum, is let's see what we can do locally to try to move that, to try to move us to something we, I think, all would like, more renewable energy source, more clean, clean technology. So what's the purpose of this? What are we trying to accomplish in this forum? <coughs> really three things. The first one is awareness. We would thought it'd be great to get people together talk about specific issues on climate and energy to help people understand better the challenges that we have locally, regionally, state, and, and nationally. So that's the first thing, relevance. What we're hoping to do is share ideas that we want to not just have this as a, uh, a talking to you, but a talking together. And so we're really gonna try to do that. And we're gonna try to limit, we have an hour and a half, so we're gonna try to limit the discussion in, for this on the talk part about 45 minutes, so we can then have questions and ideas that people have. Because you remember, we have five organizations a part of this, and they're all doing a little different things. So if you have ideas about what we can do on the island, both with those groups and individually, I'd like to hear that. But most importantly, action. That's why we really want to be here, is action. We really believe that we need to take action, again, in the local, regional, and state and country level. So what's our program? Well, we're starting, this is our first one. Uh, in November, we'll have our next one. And uh, what, the third Saturday, 10 to 11.30. But then we're taking December off. But in January and February, because of the Great Decisions um, series, we're going to do two at nighttime. So we'll do one January and February at nighttime on the third Wednesday. And then we'll kick back into the um, Saturdays from March to June. So. Um, we'll get stuff out to you and keep you apprised of what's going on. What are some of the upcoming topics? Uh, next, no, this November, or in a month, we're going to have electrification and transportation. Should be really neat. We're going to have uh, Kids Up Transit come and talk about electric buses. We're going to talk about the, uh, the Washington State Ferries. We're going to talk about the ferries, electrification of ferries. We got a guy, Bill Moyer, is coming. Yeah. All right. 
wrong Bill Moyers. We could have said that. We should have said that. The Bill Moyers coming in, we would have. But this Bill Moyers is really cool, right, Steve? Yeah, really cool. So, and we have climate justice. We have a great one, electrical grid, um, and the carbon fee and dividend um, for citizens' climate lobby. It's a core issue for them, renewable energy. So um, that, that's our program. <laughs> so um, understanding climate change and understanding what can be done about it is largely a scientific endeavor. What we should do about it and what we, how we should go about it are topics that have moral uh, and philosophical implications. Uh, what we actually will do about it is why you're here. <clears throat> the uh, reason I expect that Christine and I were asked to say a few words at the beginning of this um, is that uh, governmental policy is largely uh, a mechanism through which we actually take the actions that we decide we're going to take. Um, and at the local level in Washington, the comprehensive plan is the expression of that policy. As you all probably know, a comprehensive plan is actually a requirement of the State Growth Management Act, uh, which places certain requirements on cities uh, to plan uh, 20 years in advance. In doing our recent comprehensive plan update on Bainbridge Island, we took a longer view uh, and realized that most of the decisions that we make uh, with regard to our growth are going to have implications for many decades in the future. And so we set a 100-year horizon uh, for our thinking. And at the end of February this year, we finally approved the comprehensive plan. And uh, for those uh, aspiring to be on the city council, that's kind of been the main work we've been involved in for the last four years. And I'm sure you'll find an issue to occupy your next four years. The Seattle Times yesterday, Jerry Large uh, wrote an article about the importance of STEM education. Uh, and his point was that uh, while it's important uh, to educate our young people uh, in science uh, to prepare them for high-tech jobs, in a, in a broader sense, uh, it's critically important that we all be educated in science and technology in order to make the excuse me in order in order to make the choices understand the the um, social implications of what's happening to us uh, as we started our comprehensive plan uh, update that became very apparent uh, to those of us on the council and the citizens who are actively involved in uh, grappling with a lot of really pretty complicated scientific information uh, in trying to understand the implications of climate change on our water resources and other parts of our life uh, for the coming decades. And Laura and Echo Adapt uh, got involved very early uh, in our update process and were materially uh, helpers in that regard and kept our nose to the grindstone. So um, the resulting plan uh, recognizes from the very beginning uh, in the introduction the central role that climate change is going to play in the life of our community over the coming decades. And uh, to make the comprehensive plan more than a simple formalistic compliance with state law, uh, at the end of each one of the elements of the comprehensive plan, we included a list of things that we resolved as a city to actually do to make things happen. Um, and in the um, environmental element, um, one of the things we wanted to do was immediately address uh, the effect of greenhouse gases and uh, otherwise uh, prepare ourselves to uh, cope with and adapt to climate change. And so we formed a climate change advisory committee. Uh, Mike um, and Laura and others uh, have identified yourselves. Uh, Cole Medina is actually the council liaison to that committee, and they are um, have hit the ground running, um, hopefully um, working to get a handle on our greenhouse gas emissions and understand how we can actually make some reductions. And uh, this forum uh, is actually a reflection, not of the work directly of that committee, but of, of another one of the policies of the comprehensive plan, which is to 
uh, increase education understanding on the issues of climate change. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Laura and uh, participating in the rest of the discussions. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks, Mike. So, um, Mike asked me to just say a few words, like a few minutes, about what the state's doing. And like Val, I, I um, prepared some notes, but I actually asked the staff in Olympia, what has the state been doing on climate change and what are some ideas for moving forward? And they literally gave me nine pages of notes. So I'm going to summarize the highlights. I want to start by saying that the first page of what the staff sent to me was so, it made me so happy. So I want to start with that news. Um, first of all, our state has been a leader, as you all know, um, for the past over a decade um, among all states in clim addressing climate change and addressing the transition from dirty fuel to renewable energy. Um, so Senator Phil Rockefeller, whose seat I took, or now, now represents, um, was clearly a leader in this. And in 2006, it was his bill that... Um, that basically copied what California did with clean cars and put that into statute in Washington state law. And that has been a huge tool um, that our state has been able to rely on in reducing uh, emissions from transportation, the transportation sector. So you already got your applause, but thank you, Phil. Um, but the great news, really, is that even before Governor Inslee was in office, and we all know Governor Inslee is like the greenest governor ever in the country, and um, climate change and carbon action has been a top priority for him. Even before that, the state was doing a lot. In 2008, Governor Gregoire put forward a series of executive orders to help the state meet the, the goals of the Kyoto um, Agreement. And the legislature, back when we had a Democratic majority, ratified most of those. And so one of the goals that the state set out in 2008 was that by 2020, our emissions levels would be down to what they were in 1990. Seems like a huge goal, right? 30 years to get back to where we were in 1990. Between 1990 and, two, and 2020, our state will have grown in population by 3 million people. Almost, not quite double, 4.7 to 7.7. But our greenhouse gas emissions will be back to what they were in 1990. So huge first step for our state. And a lot of that, a lot of that is the transition of the economy. You know, the recession slowed down, down um, manufacturing, and a lot of the, a lot of the manufacturers that have come back have retooled, and they're less polluting than they were. They've modernized the factories. But a ton of that reduction is because of transportation and that just the fuel efficiency is higher and people are driving less. And that driving less component goes back to what Val was talking about. Now that is thanks to the growth management. Those three million people that are moving into our state, are the, the increase is mostly happening in the more dense areas where people don't need to be driving as much. And then, of course, the younger generation just isn't driving as much um, for many, many reasons. So that's the good news. We're on track. The next step of that is to reduce our emissions by 25 percent below 1990, by 2035. That was seen as a really tough goal 10 years ago. Now scientists say that we need to, and the Department of Ecology are suggesting that goal needs to be more like 40 percent if we really want to be doing our part um, in helping mitigate and adapt to climate change. So that 40% is kind of the next question, how are we going to do that? Because frankly, we were able to do the first goal without massively changing people's lifestyles. How do we do that? How do we do phase two and still keep our economy booming and not have too much pushback from citizens because there's too much change happening? So that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge for you all um, as well. Because Bainbridge is a place that's doing it and where people are um, People are engaged and interested. And it's places like Bainbridge, honestly, it's you guys that have really helped to push PSC out of coal. And they're going to keep going along that track, but it's the voices coming from our community that are helping to push, um, push the culture in the direction. So where we're, where we're headed really in the legislature, um, we know Governor Inslee, this is the number one priority for the governor. Ever since he was elected, the legislature has had a Republican-dominated Senate. So um, even the first year that Governor Inslee was in office, he set up a climate action work group 
that was bipartisan, met around the state, uh, was supposed to come up with ideas. And the two folks, two of the folks that the Republicans nominated for that committee were basically climate change deniers. And so that whole process ended up with no, no end results. A lot of good science was shared, a lot of good reports, but no political results that the legislature could act on. So what we've been doing is there is a general acknowledgement in the legislature that adapting to climate change is necessary and that there are things, modernizing the economy addresses some of the pollution issues. So we have been able to get bipartisan agreement on things like extending the solar tax incentives, electrifying the, um, the transportation network, doing the research that, that we should be doing on things like ocean acidification and figuring out why Puget Sound is dying. We've been able to get bipartisan agreement on that stuff. And so, um, regardless of wh where the majority lies in the legislature, I think we'll be able to continue to make um, movement in that direction. Um, but the key issue is, what do you do with the big pollution sources? What do we do with transportation, which we know is the, is the number one um, source of carbon emissions in the state? And how do we get sort of an agreement? It's not even about being bipartisan. It's an agreement of, among the citizens of the state that they will support that will help us move forward with the transportation and the pollution aspects of this. Um, so those are the, basically the comments I wanted to share. I hope that, that I kind of, I started it with the intention of saying there's a lot of work we can do. Um, looking at Ellen, um, and Erica I know is also here, we had coffee yesterday and we were basically talking about how the concept of how do we change the utility regulatory structure in the state so that um, communities have the way, a way to determine how they want to move forward. So a lot of what we've been talking about on Bainbridge is contrary to PSC's business model, right? And it's contrary to the way the state regulates utilities. And so if we really want to make a difference, how do we change that regulatory structure to help the, in, the industry, the, the, big, the big companies that are providing the electricity, um, do the right thing and, and help us do the right thing? So I think that's a major direction that we're going to be looking at as well. But again, that idea is coming from Bainbridge. Um, it's shared by folks in Olympia and Bellingham and Bellingham, but it's you all that are sort of driving that conversation with PLC. And it's PSC that's saying that they need to be a little bit more um, reflective of their customers' wishes, thanks to a lot of the work that has gone on here. So with that, I will leave my comments at that. I'm going to stay for the rest of the morning, and I'm happy to answer questions. But I'm hoping really to learn a little bit and to get a sense of the direction that the island is headed, um, so that I know how to represent myself better. Thank you. I'm sorry for introduce Raw. I wanted to thank the uh, organizing committee. Here we have Charles, Charles again, Charles, Randall, uh, Steve, where are you? Steve, Erica, Brian, um, okay, let's see, I got oh, Laura, uh, and me. I think that's it. Uh, it's always a hard to forget. So, um, I wanted to introduce Dr. Rod Hansen. Um, she's the chief scientist and executive director of ECODAP. And uh, Laura, is, she's very modest. She won't tell you, but she's really a, a national expert on adaptation. Her, her company that she started um, with her, where's, where's Eric? Eric, you still here? You know, okay. Uh, they go around the country helping government, cities, trying to learn how to adapt to climate change. So we really are, I am thankful that Laura is on our island and is a part of the community here trying to move forward. So I think we feel, I feel really great. And she's not only uh, very bright, but she's an incredibly nice. Is that, is that your son? Oh, good. You have a nice mom. I know you, you don't want to hear those kind of things. But yeah. Anyway, I want to introduce Laura. Come on up. Thanks. Is my microphone on? Okay. okay, so I'm going to begin with a little bit of an apology. 
Um, I am dreadfully sick and dead. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I woke up and couldn't sleep and was coughing and decided to take some cold medication. This has been a terrible idea. Um, so we're going to see how this goes. I have a chair here because I may be sitting down. Um, so, uh, as Val mentioned, um, he said that uh, God has grown up from the Bainbridge Community Foundation um, and a little bit of additional funding from the Bullets Foundation to develop a Bainbridge Island Climate Impact Assessment. Um, and that work actually has been expanded to providing guidance to the entire Puget Sound region. Um, but the goal of the Bainbridge Climate Impact Assessment is really to help inform the process of updating a comprehensive plan. Communities across the country have comprehensive and master plans or general plans, the three of those things exist, um, depending on where you live, some states have known, and they're not going to go city and county level. And the vast majority of those that are going on right now don't incorporate the reality of climate change into it. Yet these are 20, 30, 50, 100 year plans um, that are not planning for what will the situation be going forward. And that makes us all a society to the And that is terrible too. Um, so how do we, how we wanted to change that? And Stacey Norman, who will be coming later on this morning, um, has been, my, has been uh, Eric and my collaborator on this. And she's also been on our own in the Trigger Crisis and Consulting. But prior to being here, she did a lot of planning in the um, two cottages. Um, and so we saw this great opportunity for us to work together to come up with some guidance and immediately try to apply and test it with the community that was updating its comprehensive plan. And even better, the community that we lived in, that we were very sad to live in a community that wouldn't be doing this. So, in order to make the future what we wanted it to be, we jumped in. Um, and I based my thinking about climate change on making sure that everyone understands that it really is an everyday issue. Climate change is not a special issue that scientists need to think about. It is not a special issue that policymakers need to think about. It's actually something that needs to be part of things we think about every day. And Yogi Berra, who is really the forerunner of climatology, has a quote that applies more and more to things every day. I think I, I, I used this quote for 10 years now, 15 years now, and since last November, it's even more appropriate. Um, yeah, I would like to so here is why you should not fix slides in the morning after you take your benefit. Pretend there are pictures along the bottom of other food product and pictures. Um, so there are a few decisions that you make that are not affected by climate change, and this is actually one of my absolute favorite color games. Uh, people will try and think, tell me something and say, oh, yeah, this is related to climate change. Um, so we can do that later. Now is a good day to do that because I'll come up with really funny answers. Um, so when we jumped into doing this, we had three major goals. The first was to understand the impact of climate change for being uh, People, um, as someone who works in climate science all the time, it's really hard for me to remember that not everyone can look at a regional map or projection and think about how it applies to it. I look at it and immediately can I go through the litany of the time to your slide of what is that, how does this unfold and what does it mean? I'm not going to get all of it because a lot of that is special information that individuals who work on a specific topic will know, which is why I want to build the capacity of all of you that make these decisions. But that means that the first thing was we had to translate climate science to being with them. Fortunately, we have a lot of people on this island who can help do that. Um, the second is to translate those implications to the various areas of local interest. And for the purposes of this product that I'm going to talk about today, I have a couple of copies of the Danbridge Island Climate Impact Assessment. It's also available online. Um, so if anyone wants to look at it, just one more look at um, We use the, um, the comprehensive plan on um, I'm sure that all of you who don't you can save government from this real thing but I'll talk more in detail about the things And the real underlying goal of those two first enabling conditions um, is to move our community towards options that have a real impact to create a resilient Cambridge. So a word about the word resilience. Um, 
when I talk about resilience, I, I'm really talking about three kinds of options that they would go into any other community to stay. He can be resistant if you have to keep things the same as they ever were, as they would go into. How do you build seawalls? How do you harden uh, infrastructure? So, really, what are the things you can do so that conditions are the same as they would go into? I think you can definitely probably tell the kind of resistance to each other. The next set of solutions are things that are around resilience, which is how do you respond to that change but continue to do the kinds of things you're doing. Um, but you might have to modify them. The picture that I have in the center of the resilience, those are houses that are designed in the Netherlands that actually float up with rising sea levels. They're built on pillars and they are raised with the elevation. They're built on the edge of a barn, so the land behind them to the um, and then the last kind of thing to respond, that's where we say, well, wow, we actually can't do what we've been doing anymore. We need to do something very different or move where we're doing. There has to be a major adjustment. And we need to find solutions that are in all those categories. There are some things for which we're going to say, we need a resistance solution, at least for a while, because we don't know what the alternative is, or we can't yet afford the alternative and we're going to plan for it. There will be things where we can build the flexibility in a right away and extend the shelf life of that solution. And there are things where we're just going to have to very really quickly say, we need to be doing something different that is not worth our community's time, money, and interest to allow us to continue to spend money. Okay, so the comprehensive plan elements for the review of that. Um, our water resources, housing and transportation, human services, capital facilities, land use, utilities, community, sorry, economy, culture, and environment. And so for each one of these, we wanted to be able to have solutions in um, So we knew that there was a lot of climate kind of science that was available. There's a regional assessment that the University of Washington does that pretty regularly. I'll talk about that in a moment. There's also the regional assessment. Um, there's the National Climate Assessment, which is available online. There's the spin-off tools that are the uh, that are the science data that's now, since we started this project, unfortunately, available on the um, climate.gov climate resilience toolkit website, um, which is a great tool called Climate Explorer that has county level climate data with projections for temperature precipitation <laughs> and a number of factors around that. And then the state of Washington has some science tools and data, um, and the Department of Ecology actually spearheads uh, to source them with all the state agencies to coordinate the actions on climate change and to gather common climate data. Uh, a lot of it is done created by the state impact group at the University of So, for each of these elements, we created element groups. So, for every element of the comprehensive plan, we did an overview of this is the science that's relevant for this this element, these are the kinds of things you can ask when you're thinking about it, and these are the kinds of things that I'll be going into more detail. This is the statistics. We then did community and expert elicitation. Um, how many of you in this room attended one of the four workshops that happened during this? Um, we did some um, uh, sharing of specific briefs with people we thought had specific knowledge we wanted to make sure to capture, including city staff. Um, and uh, we put all of that together into what became the Bainbridge Island Climate Impact Assessment. We went a little bit beyond the Climate Impact Assessment because one of the things that the climate literature says, if you just give people the problem, they will not do anything about it. So we also wanted to give people a menu of ideas of options of what could be done, as well as some very specific recommendations of what states you have in an infinite wisdom that we should be doing with this um, So that was direct input into the comprehensive plan. Stacey and I actually using what we created from the climate impact assessment, read through the comprehensive plan and provided to the city staff a redlined version of each element with our suggestions of what we thought should be changed in order to increase the resilience of the community. Uh, we released the Bainbridge Island Climate Impact Assessment because we also wanted it to be used by the rest of the community. And I'll be talking later on hopefully soon as I'm going to my throat, about um, specific suggestions for your personal home, your businesses, our schools, and activity groups. Um, and then, as I said earlier, we got funding from the Bullock Foundation 
to expand this for use by communities around the Puget Sound. <laughs> and I actually just found out from um, Atlanta, Georgia, and Madison, Wisconsin, where they're actually going to be using some of the as well. So, um, communities can make good decisions when they have information and know what questions to ask. Um, the Washington, um, Ameri- Washington chapter of the American Planning Association says that the climate protections that are currently available provide useful information that's sufficient, sufficient for planners to integrate into decision making today. Unfortunately, most people don't know how to integrate it. That's the final point. And the BSA was a goal to figure out can we help a community overcome that block that Valley even indicated is a problem. So, uh, this is something that I talk about whenever I give a presentation about climate change. Because, uh, for reasons that I do not understand, although I think they have to do with nefarious marketing of people who don't think climate change should be dealt with, we have come to believe that climate change is rife with uncertainty. We have no idea what will happen and we can't possibly plan for it. Well, we make decisions all the time with no idea about what's going to happen. I mean, look at population projection data. My junior high school got closed down a year before I finished senior high. They restructured the entire Iowa City school system so that ninth graders would all start high school. And before that, it was seventh days and ninth grade middle school because they were convinced that there was a lot lack of junior high students coming in that would continue for the next 50 years. Well, three years after my high school was closed down and they restructured the whole thing. I don't know if you and I were overfilled, and they had to build a new junior college. So, one can say we make decisions with crappier information than climate science information to the tune of a lot of money. Whereas climate data, and I'll show you a bunch of it very quickly, shortly, actually has some certainty in it. So, the real question is given the range of potential features, and we have a good idea of what those will probably be. How do you make a good decision? And fortunately, we live in the Pacific Northwest. When I give this talk in Phoenix, it is Every morning when we get up, we have to make a decision about what is it that I should wear. When I go outside, should I take my umbrella? Um, granted, most of us don't use umbrellas, but for some of you do. Um, but when you get up in the morning, you have, to, you have to do a little bit of calculus based on what the future will bring. The first calculus is you sort of look out your window and go, does it look like it's going to rain outside? What do you think? That sort of gives you a starting point of what are the range of my options. The second thing you think about is what do I have to do today? Well, if I'm going to go out with Ari and we're going to go muck around in the tidal or we're going to go play ball, I can do whatever I want because I'm just going to get wet, come home, and be done with it. If, in fact, I will find out if I have paintings and I need to take them into Seattle to show to someone. Oh, look, yeah, pretend I do charcoal. That would be terrible. I have charcoal drawings that I'm going to take to Seattle to show to hopefully get put into a gallery. I probably want to take different I probably want to have them well covered. I probably want to be well covered. Um, but we make decisions like this all the time based on what the conditions will be and what it is we want to do. And that's exactly what we have to do with climate data and figuring out how we move forward as a society at whatever scale you do. So, always be asking, remember, but remember to So, the first thing I want you to keep in mind is that there are really four big categories of climate science that you need to apply when asking these questions. First is temperature, and there's precipitation, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. Everything else is due to some combination of these, and you can sort of work your way into it based on whatever level you want to have. <laughs> and remember, always ask them to all the people who are doing it. So, the simplest data is temperature data. Temperature project- projections are pretty solid. Um, you always will see graphs like this in the climate world, and I'll explain three major features of them, and the one that I think is more important is really comparison that is what I think I'm going to So, the, the gray boring part is always history. It always has a black line that's always empirical data. That is really what has happened. And you can even see in that really what has happened section, temperature is interesting. Very different. I think then there's usually sort of an array of future models and uh, assumptions that will take you forward. 
Uh, and they almost always have a low level end, which is this is uh, if we this is sort of a, a good case scenario, and then there's what's always labeled as a bad case scenario. Unfortunately, almost all the models that are out there, the bad case scenario is actually what we're doing today. So the assumptions follow that line. So while you could say, you know, they go up five and a half degrees, and anyone who says that and thinks that that's not a big deal, that's fine. Um, but then the other end of the spectrum is, we could go up 10, 11 degrees. Like, that's a horrific deal, and unfortunately, based on the actions that are mostly being taken in the policy arena right now, that's the top one. Look, Gary doesn't even have a hand in the Right on. Um, so when you look at these, don't take yourself by saying, oh, it'll probably be that lower thing. We shouldn't go crazy and do a lot. No, we should go crazy and do a lot. I mean, think about your house. I want you to think about what your house is like if it is 11 degrees warmer on hot summer days in this region. What does that mean for your insulation? Most of the people that I know who live on the island are going to be in the summer on a hot day. Well, that's only going to get worse. Should we be designing our houses differently so that they can withstand those higher temperatures without having to rely on air conditioning? Yes. Yeah. So today we've warmed 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm working on saying things in Fahrenheit. That is my exercise as a scientist. However, I think you could all learn the centigrade scale. Um, Okay, so the rest of these I'm going to zoom through really quickly because there is this beautiful document available online made by the University of Washington that will give all of you this information in much greater depth than I can, and I have other things that I want to talk to you about. There are also a lot of resources, including our very own fire department's um, uh, hazard identification and vulnerability assessment. So this shows you that precipitation is really a hard thing to model. Temperature, beautiful thing to model. Relatively simple. Precipitation, much harder. But generally, what it says about our region is that our summers will probably become drier and we'll have uh, more variability in the weather. Uh, that has implications for stream flow, shifting the timing of when stream flow happens and the amount of flow that there is. This is the fire department's uh, uh, wildfire hazard map. You probably don't think that we have a wildfire hazard map. Unfortunately, it's extremely red. It's not that a bummer after just watching what happened in some of my next attempts. Um, part of that modeling has to do with the fact that we're probably going to have some major vegetation changes on this island, which has implications for things like what kind of trees we plant. Earlier this year, I was in Central Minnesota where we ran an excellent teaching plan. <laughs> And one of the things that I do at that event every year is that I don't have people give us money to pay for aspects of carbon, which if you'd like to talk to me about the value of at a later date, I'm happy to do that. Um, instead, what we do is we have people donate money and time to helping work on a local adaptation project in the city where we're having our event. Um, and in the case of St. Paul, they've actually done a great modeling of what species of trees we're going to be moving into the region. And they knew that all their local trees were dying from uh, off borer beetle and beet chest. So we spent a day with the mayor of St. Paul and their urban forestry group and the Mississippi River Alliance replanting trees along the Mississippi corridor um, to prepare the city of St. Paul for having a tree canopy going into the future. They are three city USA and they'd like to maintain it, but they can't wait for all their trees to die before they start making a transition. So, the next figure will tell you why I'm bothering to tell you all that, which is that this is the projection for Doug Fur. Our little island is red, and red means that Doug Fur is risk at risk um, in less than 50% of the models, but it is in fact at risk in our region. So, the loss of Doug Fur is possible on our island as we transition from a maritime evergreen needle leaf forest to a temperate area like this. And that means we should be thinking about what that means for us. Okay, two level ones. So, if in fact we go by what I told you before about how we want to um, uh, think about what the future is like, it's probably the bottom section, which is the A1FI uh, scenario, which says that we can have um, sea level rising up to 56 inches by the end of the century. We need a little more specific information on this. Um, but uh, that's a lot. 
and that has some serious implications for some of these regions. So again, the fire department has indicated they're prone to flooding, and that these hundred-year flood maps coupled with some sea level rise maps indicate that some serious pieces of infrastructure where we've been investing a lot of money in the city um, are vulnerable. And I'll tell you where these are in case you are not as map obsessed as I am. So the upper one is fairly Eagle Harbor, and you can see at the head of the harbor we have a major road, one of the only two roads that takes all of our population to the southern half of this island, which I would argue is a lot of people, although at some point I could find out how many of them. Um, that road probably needs to be rethinking either where it is or how it is built so that it can respond to the fact that it will almost inevitably be underlined in the coming year. It will probably be undermined before the number one. Um, this other map is of Linwood Center, um, where we also have a lot of development going on, including infrastructure of not only roads, but things like sewage treatment plants and pipelines, and how do we plan for um, and rebuild for them. That just shows you how far you can go to. Again, too much practical, you can do that. Um, so, soil stability is something that also can adversely interact with changing precipitation patterns and sea level rise. Fortunately, there's a lot of mapping by the Department of Ecology. This is summarized by the fire department again um, of where those in unstable places are. We did a little attempt in the um, BICIA to translate that into some particularly vulnerable areas where um, we indicated that intersection of sea level rise undermining already unstable um, Okay, so finally, the last, uh, the hundredth horse rider of the apocalypse um, is ocean acidification, which is something significant for people who live on an island uh, in a marine system. So there's only a couple of islands in the Great Lakes, so it's going to be such a big deal. But there's actually starting to be some more complex acidification of lakes now as well because of the CO2 in the atmosphere. But we don't have to worry about that, really. Um, so, uh, giving you the upside. Um, so, the, oh, because we put CO2 up into the atmosphere, uh, half or more of all the carbon dioxide that goes up in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean. And when it's absorbed by the ocean, it forms carbonic acid, and that carbonic acid results in acidification. And that acidification is bad for marine life. Marine life has been. Uh, Allowed to live in a in, in a, an environment that has very has been very stable in terms of pH. In fact, when I was a graduate student, I wanted to manipulate pH on an experiment that I was doing, and my major professor called me into her office and said, "That's really going to be a waste of time. The ocean has a tremendous buffering capacity. I wouldn't worry about that. I really need to get that." Uh, but the other half of that is, is that we actually don't have a lot of research on what are the implications of ocean acidification. There are some things like the shells <laughs> of um, things like uh, foraminifera and moss, where we know it uh, limits their ability to form cells and it degrades their cells. I guess they're into coral reefs, but we're not sure about that too. But there's a whole bunch of things where we really don't know how it plays out. We don't know a lot about, we know that this gills really like certain pH ranges, but we don't know exactly what it means for their function. We don't know what it means for developmental stages of a lot of things. Um, we don't know what it means for a lot of phytoplankton even. So there's a lot of things we still need to learn about what are going to be the implications. Sorry about that big downer. I'm sure you can do something about all this. Um, climate change isn't the only thing that's going on, though. So when you're thinking about solutions to climate change, you need to be thinking about it in terms of the other factors that are affecting our city. That includes things like changing population, um, uh, changing uh, technology, changing interests, changing patterns of how people use the island, all sorts of things. And this can lead you to get the data overload. But the important thing you have to remember is that you can't let that lead you to paralysis. Um, you have to force that to make you think about things differently. And fortunately, we have an umbrella, so we're all good. So, uh, I would like you to use this as part of your umbrella. Um, so, on the right hand side is a really small table of contents that you can read. I will be showing you a lot of things that are small that you can read, but that's going to make you so excited to go and look at the country. Um, so, like I said, uh, Stacey and Eric and I uh, did assessments by each element. 
So uh, for each one, we have an overview of, of what, is this, what is this element about, because most of the community users don't know anything about the idea of this kind of element. Um, and that's okay, because it's not technically good. Um, we created a table for each one, and I'll show you an example of it in a moment, which are what are the implications of climate change for this topic. Um, and then we created what we refer to as the essential questions, which are what are the questions that you as a decision maker at your home, at your business, or the city should be asking when you think about this topic and climate change. And then for each one of these, we came up with mitigation options. And I forgot to give you the mitigation adaptation, a word about others. In the world of climate change, these two words mean nothing like anything else in the world. Um, mitigation means that you are reducing the root cause of climate change, so that's reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas adaptation is how we respond to the change that we cannot we cannot avoid. So we have suggestions for both those things in each of the sections, um, and then some specific implementation opportunities um, for each one of those. Uh, one of those elements. Um, so I'm going to use the water resources uh, section as an example. The overview basically just gave you sort of what, are, what was the key language of the original platform. So this is the updated now, it's the updated version. Um, but the premise is that water is essential for the health and sustainability of the natural and built environment on the side. I think that's an easily agreeable factor. Um, Deb, as the representative of the water shed group on our island, can uh, convince you of that with respect to that season. Um, and my compliance itself said that adequate protection of the important water resources requires an understanding of what can affect the quality and quantity. Also, of great importance is the mag management of the resource by guarding against potential impacts. And that was just a wide open door to including climate change from our perspective. Um, Okay, so these are the implications of the Yes, you can't read that. But I've blown it up so you can. So for each kind of impact, um, which will be the small boxes, we go through what are the implications. And I will not read all of these, but you can look through them. You can look through them at home. Um, so the precipitation, the real thing, is changing patterns and extremes, longer duration and greater intensity. Um, and that has implications for discharge compliance of our our storm water and our food treatment plant. That's kind of a big deal because it's something we already have challenges with. And if we're not thinking about how we do repair and redesign the incorporate that, that will cost us more money in the long term both in terms of future changes and uh, um, the storm water system is maybe undersized uh, to accommodate greater flow, which will mean more flooding on our streets. Um, so there's all sorts of implications for what this means and this is actually what so I also did this for temp we did this for temperature and water resources, we did it for vegetation change, and we did it for sea level rise. If if you go to the there will be a link at the end. But you can also go to the eco.org website. Um, and on that website in our library there's a copy of this. So there's also a workshop support page that has all of the presentations and everything that was used in the workshop that went along with this, uh, this the BICIA's creation, um, as well as the final product. We also wanted to consider what is the relevant non-climate data um, that may affect the goals of this element. So population changes is a big one for weather use. Um, and accounting for the anticipated increase or decrease due to climate refugees or growth in general would be really important to how you think about this um, Okay. So then we did the essential questions. And these are an example of some of the questions. There are a lot of them because we've all be asking a lot of questions. Um, but this is seven of them, which we also can't read, so I'll read you a couple of them. Um, one, are current uh, precipitation patterns fully understood as to how they impact water resources, wastewater system, and stormwater management on the enemy? And I can look at that and say, hey, good, do you know the answer to that? Okay, she gave the categorical scientist answer of maybe. Um, three, will our groundwater recharge pathways be affected by altered precipitation patterns and will existing or proposed development and impermeable surfaces further confound it? And you don't need to know the scientific answer to any of these questions. The point is, these questions should lead you to think about what are our policies. So in the case, in the case of the last one I read, the question should be, well, 
do we have inadequate impermeable surfaces? Do, do we have inadequate permeable surfaces? Should we in fact be changing the way code is so that we can elect, so that we require a greater amount of developed area be left as permeable? Um, and so that is what this is leading to. This should not lead to the desire to say, we need to study. Please don't ever tell me that in the we need a lot of studies about climate change, but we also need people to start doing something. Because if we wait until all the information that tells us the answers to all these things are in, first of all, it will no longer be right. Because climate change will be going on for the next 2,000 years at least. If you look at the sea level rise uh, data, the projections on that are the lag time of the melting of ice and the expansion of the world's oceans goes on for two millennia. I will be starting on being aligned to the solution on that once we know how to play that. Okay, then we get to the part that um, that uh, Stacey and I like the most, which we refer to as table nine. Um, everyone on the island I know will be talking about table nine. There'll be table nine taxi and it's going to be um, So for each one of the planning sectors, that's column one, we came up with the main actions that this sector can take in terms of mitigation. So for water resource management, the two first ideas we came up with were retaining vegetation and tree canopy that, that serves to enhance local air and water quality. So that's something we can do that will put back in one second. We go back as five tenets for how we take on climate change. And the five tenets are one, um, to uh, manage for appropriate space. So think about the space you really need for systems to work because of rain fix, because of whatever you need to fix. Um, the second one is to reduce our non climate stressors. The third one is to manage for uncertainty. And the last two are to um, reduce the rate and extent of local climate change and reduce the rate and extent of global climate change. Those are both still going to make it um, So if we can protect our vegetation on island, we can actually reduce a lot of heat um, impacts and we can do a lot to protect our hydro energy. Notice I said nothing about COVID because I can't prove that. Um, the second one is to maintain the ecosystem function and the ability of systems and habitats to migrate and function over time. Uh, the next column, which is longer, is the main action of the sector that can support adaptation, which are things like plan improvement, um, plan improvement, source development, and still matter infrastructure based on future precipitation scenarios. So let's think about what those are and make sure that we have the right space and, um, and systems in place. This is pretty much what everyone always talks about culverts. I will not bore you with the talk about culverts, but if you want to find the talk about culverts and climate change, Google that and you'll find those 5,000. Implement supply and demand waterside conservation, protect ecosystems and their buffers, pay attention to shifting species and revegetate the restaurants and other projects. That's like the example I just talked about that St. Paul is taking on. And um, utilize all compact and low impact development techniques, which reduce impermeable and engineered areas. And then in the last column, uh, we have what are the implementation options of all of these ideas specifically on Bainbridge Island. And they almost all start with something we refer to as the climate assessment certification, which is kind of a little bit analogous to an environmental impact statement, but if you're doing any sort of project to see whether or not climate would affect it. Um, and I'm really happy to say that Stacey and I have gotten another grant from the Bainbridge Community Foundation and from the Bullet Foundation to create what that is. And we're going to work with a series of pilot communities on that, and hopefully Bainbridge Island is going to be one of them. Since the BFC gave us money to do it, they really like that. No pressure for those of you who are not um, Require any water resource data gathering and analysis to include metrics that are sensitive to and identifiable as much as the climate change. So we do a lot of monitoring on this island. Why don't we start actually collecting that data in terms of local climate and implications? And that's one of the things we do in the we can steal from other places. Um, so each one of these sections for all of the element topics has very specific recommendations on that. Okay. So you're not saying, hey, that's what city council can do. I'm off the hook. I don't have to do anything. But that's not true. Um, Stacey and I came up with some of you guys, too. Um, the first one is to inform yourself. So get a copy of the BICIN. It is available for free online. You don't even have to print it. Just look at it on your screen whenever you want. Um, Bainbridge Community Broadcasting has done a series of podcasts on the implications of climate change on Bainbridge Island, as well as how to use this product. 
Um, Stacy and I did one. My son has done one. It's like a billion of them. Dad has done one. Everyone in this room has done a BCD podcast. Raise your hand. That's what we can all hear each other talk. It'll be great. Um, and then there's that University of Washington, uh, PJ Town State of the Lord's Report that I mentioned, which is a really nice bite sized chunk of climate data. You can also go to Climate Explorer on the Climate Resilience Toolkit and play with Kits of Town as they are. And so the kids can have a totally fun to play with all the different parameters. Um, and if you need help finding any of that, email me at myrbco.com. The second one is help the city incorporate climate change in all its activities. It's in the comprehensive plan now. We need to help the city put it into actual practice. Um, there are those of us in the room who are on the Climate Change Advisory Committee, but everyone in this audience can be part of asking those climate questions, going to the meetings, and being the person who says, hey, is climate change being considered? That's number four, which is number three. Again, that makes sense. Three. Um, make your own climate savvy decisions. So I did a quick little uh, exercise the other day on the plane, so I'm going to make it look like this. Um, so if you think about home, the kinds of things that you can do, some of them you already know. Energy efficiency, uh, landscape and lawn care choices can play a big role in how much energy you use and how resilient the island will be. Um, facility siting and design, uh, we talked a little bit about earlier, how do we make our houses so that they can be uh, not, they don't need expensive energy to maintain their temperature. Uh, encouraging non-motorized transport and carport, you know, mention of the growth fan zone, and how we're having more people live closer to where they need to be so that they earn a carbon emissions. How do we decrease that part of our carbon footprint? So and the fire is really high and causes a whole other piece of consternation known as traffic that other people complain about all the time. But as a bike rider and a walker, I don't know that. Um, and then conservation measures, including reducing consumption and selecting traffic. So last year, I made a plea to me. And if anyone ever sees me violating this, I want you to come over and, and, and scold me for it. I made the commitment that if I was downtown and I really wanted a chai from Blackford, which is my favorite beverage in the town, which is the English chai is great, and I just sent it out for them, um, that I will not go in and get a chai unless I will sit there and drink it out of a ceramic mug that they have provided me or have brought my own mug with me. If I need a paper cup for I do not get to get a chai. That is my own commitment to the family. I invite you all to make that same commitment. It is not such a horrible thing to do. Um, I've also gotten to know other groups for example, the workers because of that. Um, school, uh, we should have climate change for family issues. It should be a requirement because it is the future of our kids. Um, if we're, we have this big push for STEM, this is a great opportunity. Let's make STEM all about teaching kids how to understand the various factors that have to do with thinking about climate change and future projections and how you integrate that data into the implications for society. Um, and how can they develop the, the ideas for how they'll improve the future because they're going to be getting all this. And uh, it would be nice if it wasn't just a mess of seawalls, pumps, and other crap. Um, and anyone who hasn't seen the preview for Geostorm, I don't really think anyone needs to see the whole movie. But the preview for Geostorm should convince you that the engineered solution to this problem is a terrible idea. Um, it's all just a terrible idea. Yep, yep, I'm almost done. Uh, and that is not me saying it's a bad idea. Um, community groups. So we all on this island, we have, we have more community groups on this island than any place I've ever lived in my life. I live with our places. And we could be making this island incredibly resilient if all of our community groups were thinking about what, is climate, what are the implications for climate change for what I do. Even if it's just funding for it. Think about the vulnerability of your funding source, but more importantly, I think, think about the vulnerability of whatever action it is you're taking to society. Again, part of the game, I just think through it with any community group that doesn't know what their vulnerability might be. That is called a vulnerability assessment, and we can do it over a cup of chocolate. Um, uh, it applies to all the activities that we do from social services to recreation. Businesses, energy and water efficiency really can help improve bottom line. Energy will only be getting more expensive, water will only be getting more expensive. If you can come up with ways to do what you do, diminishing your need of both of those things, you can dramatically improve your long term plan. Um, improve and select more stable supply chain, more stable transportation links. 
the number of warnings I've gotten from FedEx in the past month for everything being shut down all around the country um, speaks to the need for thinking about how do you have a local redundant supply chain that allows you to respond in terms of, um, of shortage or something. It also has a lower carbon footprint. Um, landscape places and conservation actions again, uh, and determining how a stable, less climate vulnerable local economy actually can be a benefit to your business. Speak to any of the pharmaceutical companies in Puerto Rico today if you don't think that's a good thing. Uh, and then number three, number three is again in all cases, be the voice that asks those questions about climate change. Uh, it is never a silly question to ask. We gave uh, the city of Bainbridge Island a couple of homework assignments, too. One is that we wanted them to create a climate change task force. They created one. It wasn't really what Stacey and I had in mind. We actually had been in the city staff, but instead of I am on it. But uh, hopefully we'll be getting the city staff engaged in it um, to move forward. The second is to develop our required climate uh, assessment certification, which we are going to be able to help with that. Um, and the third is to just make sure that city council is constantly applying their understanding from what they want to be able to do. So uh, the climate impact assessment can help us. Has done the assessment. The plan that we can actually fill in now because we have the comprehensive plan done, although the multi-hazard mitigation plan states can also benefit from this. And then we need to get to that implementation piece. Um, and finally, we're going to need to evaluate whether or not what we're doing is working for our island or do we need to try different things. Um, uh, we also have this regional documentation if you have friends in other communities or you want to help the county. That document is an analog of what we did for Bainbridge Island, um, scale by it. Um, and then there's a tool that EcoDesk runs online called Take the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, which is a great tool for seeing what our communities or uh, resource managers in other parts of the country do in response to climate change. We have some international examples on it as well. It's at takex.org. So, this is what I'm leaving you I want you to use the Bainbridge Island Climate Impact Assessment to sustain the legacy of our time. We have a very unique history on this island, um, and it would be nice to be able to carry that forward, uh, both in terms of uh, things that uh, we want people to learn from and remember, and things that we want people to uh, carry forward. Uh, we want to challenge the imagination of our present. That means everyone in this room, no matter what age or information. Um, and then comes to the survival for our future. So really short order. Um, and my thought I'm turning this back over to you. Thank you, everybody. So real quick, and then we'll get to questions again. Thank uh, Eagle Harbor, donation to our all of there. I just recognize the organizing committee specifically. want to thank Jimmy Lindley and Charles for the website. And uh, I had a tutorial on Facebook, and I still don't understand what the hell it is, and I don't know. And just a funny story, I started trying to figure it out. My son called me and said, Dad, you don't know what you're doing, do you? So I guess I'm sending stuff out to him, and he said, just stop. So, okay. so, so there you go. But I also want to thank our, our speakers, Mayor, uh, Senator, and, and Laura, and all of you for coming. Um, and just before we go to questions, is there a the next slide? Just an advertisement next in November. Um, Steve uh, has brought together an incredible panel for our next one, so please uh, advertise this for us. And I think this is going to be a really, really um, fun and, and informative. So, with that, I want to open it up to questions to, to Laura and, and Christine and, and Val. Uh, I have a question for Christine. So, my understanding is that there is a program that you probably have heard of called Community Choice Aggregation. And that, that's to allow communities to group together and choose their source of energy. Like we could choose salt instead of coal. But that to do that, like the first thing that has to happen is the state has to pass some legislation. Is this on your screen? Is anybody talking about it? Is this a setup? <laughs> it is on my screen. People have been talking about it. I've done um, a little bit of research with legislative staff um, through this fall. It's the CCA that Fran is referring to was passed and is working in California. 
Um, our regulatory structure is very different than the way they do it in California. So one of the um, the pitfalls, I guess, or the challenges that we have that we would need to have changed in state law is that under our state law, the utilities are regulated and they come in, they're regulated for their rates. And so they are allowed to charge a certain rate that will allow them to collect, um, you know, to pay back their infrastructure investment and make a specified profit for their investors. So it's a rate regulation. When when we look at a community changing the structure of the energy, if that's going to impact the rate structure, then there's a, a whole regulatory system involved. So, for example, Microsoft just did this. They bought out of PSC. They're going to be in charge of their own of energy sources, essentially. They can do that. They're huge, right? They've got their data centers all over the place using a ton of energy. They've got I don't know how many employees. They're huge. And in order for them to get the buyout from um, PSC and the UTC, the Utility Transportation Commission, they actually had to pay PSC to get out of the contract and help PSC get some of the investment back that they made on the infrastructure to provide the response energy. So it's a really complicated and different. But that's one of the things that we're looking at is the concept of um, what what do we need to change in state law to allow for communities to to have the, these kinds of choices. And as I said to a couple of people, what I think we're looking at is sort of using the word resiliency because it's don't community resilience. Okay. Using the word resilience as opposed to sustainability or climate change or green energy because those trigger people. Um, but resilience is about um, how do we choose our own energy destiny and how do we do it in a way that allows us to um, you know, to be successful if there's a transmission um, cyber security attack or weather causes outage throughout the Northwest. So I think we're going to try to talk about it in those ways about resilience versus climate change and see where we can go. And then within that umbrella, there are several different ideas of how you how we could do it. So we're looking at that. Probably way more. I'll just talk as loudly as I can. Um, so follow-up question is, um, I think you can also frame it in terms of competition, um, which is what they've done in California communities, is that there are Potential energy providers and get sick so it's not an option. Um, but the existing you know, power provider gets to run on the lines and feels like they're getting something out of it as well. Um, but the other thing I really want to ask you about is community solar systems. So, in a lot of states, uh, neighborhoods can agree on using certain space and collectively buy solar to put on it, and then everyone who invests in it locally can benefit from it. In Washington State, you don't allow that, they only allow community solar on the on public land, so like we have on our city hall, um, or I believe on utility owned land. Um, but if say my neighborhood and get a whole bunch of solar on an empty lot across the street for me, we can't do that. Is there any conversation about expanding community solar? Yes. And that would be part of this kind of umbrella concept. So grab ideas like that. Now, actually we have adjusted the legislation. We'll probably have that more closer to December, which is the time for me and the next the kind of thing. I don't know what that would be. The obstacles to all so that's the kind of thing we'd be coming into the spring. So start which doesn't mean that we're all gonna be able to do it, but we start looking at what the regulatory impediments are so that we could change it. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I see that we speak about how the year has not read the report, but what I have read of the report does not speak to sustainable behavior. I have not seen anything that speaks to that. I'm very concerned about it, and I'm very saddened about the way Housing is being constructed, buildings are being constructed, and it's just one thing to get that all over the nation. We live in a progressive state. 
and we're not as progressive as we think we are because we are progressive in some areas and not necessarily in others. So just speaking about the island, we are very unprogressive from what I've seen, not from what I've read, but from my experience and what I've seen going on in the island for housing, we are building to the past. We're addressing minimum code. Minimum code is nothing more that you're allowed to legally buy and sell in the marketplace. It's a huge of that doesn't exist anymore. Okay? Yes, you can have an environment with solar energy. Yes, you can have an environment with wind energy. But if we don't look at the 40% demand that buildings take, 40% of the energy in the country is taken by housing and buildings and the matter of working it. We are still allowing communities and development, especially on this island, to be constructed with very poor enforcement or none of that, kind of that is lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. And I don't see that in the housing I don't see it in housing on the island, and I'm very saddened and very concerned about it because it's not just about the energy that we use for the demand, it's about how much less energy we can use and how much smaller of a carbon footprint that we have. There is a development right behind where I live that has 18 houses on it. For no apparent reason, they completely shift the entire place to four and a half acres of trees. They left about 2,500 square feet of trees on four and a half acres. That is the green space that was allowed. The insulation, air ceiling, and equipment in the buildings are poor at best. They are the absolute bare minimum because that's what a contractor is going to do because the city and any governing jurisdiction allows it. We've allowed it. It is the city's issue. It is not the contractor's issue. They're always going to do what they can do for the least expensive amount of money that they can do for the highest profit. That is the regime that developers do. So I'm really hoping that I would like to be kept. Okay, and I'm really addressing this to people on, people on the council. What are we doing about it? How are we addressing codes? How are we addressing building construction and development on the island for it to be sustainable? And I'm going to use that word sustainable. So that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mark, yeah. more, more so uh, I can't speak to what council is doing, but why can't this microphone? Uh, but I can speak to what. Um, but I can speak to what other places are trying. So to begin with, there's been something I think quite inspirational coming from Mercer Island, where they put a cap on the size of houses, which I think has benefit both to the sustainability of the house itself as well as the cost, because it means that you are building some houses that might be affordable by someone. But the better example that I think we have, and first of all, I'm going to to do something like that. Um, the second thing that is the city of Lancaster, California, did something transformational, and they did it almost entirely by movement by by mayor of Seattle. Now, yes, so the reason you're not familiar is the mayor of Lancaster, California, very red part of California, so don't say it's California, but I don't think it. The rest of California is not doing it. He uh, looked in the city when he became the mayor, saw that they were going broke, saw that they were losing population, they were losing business, and he wanted to change that. Um, he, he, they also saw that they had very high crime, and I forget exactly how he resolved that as part of this, but it was one of his, I think he was looking at. He changed code for what was an allowable house in Lancaster, California, and he required the incorporation of solar. He required that I believe it be a net zero energy house, and he, and he worked with, and it had to be almost net zero water. So it had to, he created, there were like requirements and water efficiency as well as landscaping. And he worked with a building company with some large scale spec building company that builds houses that are the traditional picture you see of California artifacts that they have. And he worked with them to build a market rate house 
been incorporated by other things. So there was a spec house that met all of those requirements so that the city of Lancaster could lower its energy costs to be the lowest energy cost in the region to lure businesses back so that they can have industry. So if you build a giant business, you have to have solar on the top of it. If you have a huge box store, if you have a uh, like factory, or if you have a single family house, it has The beautiful thing about that, especially in terms of the single family dwelling, is it allows for all those things that would normally be very expensive retrofits to a to be part of the mortgage, allowing more people to be able to purchase them. Yeah, uh, okay. You say, first of all, that on Bainbridge Island, nothing happens but I'm going to roll a fee out. You could say that. Uh, but with regard to the, the um, uh, question of the gentleman about building standards, uh, one thing, a frustrating thing that I've learned in my term on city council is how slow things happen uh, and how burdened we are by what we've got, what we try to get to where we want to be. The, the uh, new version of the comprehensive plan uh, commits us to adopting the green building code. And I expect that among the many things, including further staff support for the climate, in the Gallery Committee, uh, one of the many things that are going to be uh, hot topics for discussion next year, and you know, the new city council system that sets its priorities and starts talking about uh, the upcoming budget, uh, is how to get that uh, building for the change uh, for the three main date. Uh, the kinds of things that we're going to talk about. The other thing I'm going to mention is that right now, in the final stages of talking about uh, significant changes to the critical areas of the government, if it goes ahead, uh, generally or currently drastic, it's going to have a um, major indirect impact on the status of houses on the government because it's going to restrict uh, the amount of vegetation that can be removed when one of these are concerned about. So we're, we're working on uh, but uh, and if you could do things by sea act, and we live in a different country, and I think that uh, maybe we can bring that in there. Is that a trade calendar? Hi, I'm Alan Walker. I spend uh, part of my year in California come spring, and one of the things I did down there when I started down there was I uh, created some of the action groups that were focused very narrowly on how can our leaders to create policies that can't go in that direction. So we know the facts, we know what the problem is, and it's kind of connected to where it's kind of. And um, some of the policies that have happened while I've been there that I'm very excited about are the community choice aggregation. Next year we'll have all of our energy, uh, 50% of our energy will be renewable energy. Uh, that's an out to out system, so everybody will automatically get it. So think about the greenhouse gas emissions that are set by that. You can opt in for 100% renewable energy. And I came back excited about that policy and reached back to Christine and other folks that heard from me about that. And I think we need to find a path for that here because that uh, uh, current um, uh, utility is not so easy. Secondly, um, we just passed and we're about to pass an ordinance that required um, uh, installed solar and on new construction to your point about um, construction standards. So it, it's not easy making these policies, but it requires us taking that step in order for it to require contractors to meet a higher level of performance. I was aware of the Lancaster issue as well. Um, cities all over California are taking steps to require behavior that we know will cut in our staff commitments, and I'd like to see us do that here. So, um, let's, um, let's get moving. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Thank you, Don and Rick. In the uh, presentation, uh, Roy mentioned the uh, one more uh, concert. Uh, Christina had mentioned the uh, fact that transportation is the other uh, dimension. Transportation is the largest contributor to greenhouse gases. So we talk about uh, the drifting gap, but on the average, we have not focused, we have not communicated. Effectively, about the importance of density and 
supporting density, and then in that and there's been probably more than anything else to do with connectivity, and I just make it so that you can walk from one place to another, maybe bike, and that means some connecting things, and I don't know if it's going to be beneficial, but it's probably even out of the two halves of this one. So I'm uh, looking for ways that we locally address the kind of thing that the governor has done statewide by focusing on the on practical solutions and transportation, focusing on non motorized transportation. So I would be very interested in the comments that uh, uh, both of you might have to make on how we refocus ourselves uh, in a way that actually addresses that density issue. I don't know the answer to that, really, Don. We don't, as a state, we don't have a statewide non-motorized transportation plan. That's really local government um, responsibility. But I do remember when I was on the city council, the most effective conversations about non-motorized planning um, we're actually coming out of the senior center. And if people remember um, Marsha Rudolph, for example, um, a number of really cool women, um, and Don, actually, a cool man, were really, were, um, were really, they were really pushing, they were really pushing for it. And with their advocacy, we got things like the sidewalk bike lane on Erickson that helped connect. Um, we got the bike, bike rides to school with Dana Berg. And where we connected the middle school and the high school through a path that kids use all the time. We widened sidewalks, and it was really controversial that, like, four foot, five foot wide sidewalk along, um, is it Madison? Madison, um, leading up to Woodward. It's either Madison or Brooklyn. Is it Madison? Um, that was really controversial because we took down trees along the thing and we made the sidewalk really large, and people were like, oh, we're all characters, dumb. But in the meantime, when you go there after school, there are always three or four kids lined up. There's kids skateboarding, there's kids walking their bikes. But they need a ride side up there. That's what the ten year olds do. They walk in lines together. Have a lot. Um, so there's a constant push pull of the you know the feeling of the neighborhood versus how to get people back and forth in the neighborhood. And at the time when we were making those investments. It was a constant kind of struggle or challenge to balance that. And I'll, I'll just close with the idea on Erickson. We only put in a narrow bike lane going up the hill and a sidewalk on one side. And that was purposeful to keep that traffic slow so that we weren't creating a Madison on Erickson. And the bike community in Seattle was outraged that we wouldn't build it to standards. And we just said, shut up. We're <laughs> We're doing our thing here, and you know we did enough to make it something that people can walk up there. But ten years ago, fifteen years ago, that was not a pedestrian road. So I leave you guys with that because it's just, it's really um, a community effort. I think um, it starts at city planning and village town planning, and then expands to counties. So just quickly, if you want to look in the BICIA, there's a section on transportation that is largely focused on motorized transit, um, but it includes those kinds of things that you actually were mentioning. Um, I don't think that's something at all. Um, about funding and implementing a non-motorized transit plan um, and creating more complex development. I've searched with all of them. Yeah, right on. Um, but one of the things that uh, I believe is a safety idea, if you could be up here presenting this, is to create a structure of impact fees for all development permits uh, that can support and maintain um, improved transportation with a particular focus on non motorized transportation. And create continuing the character of the paths that are being based on Bainbridge Island. The, path, the, the access path system on Bainbridge Island is quite frankly one of the reasons I moved here. Um, wandering around the first day I came here, I found that such an awesome feature that reminded me of my visits to England where there's pass through on all sorts of private property um, that allow you to be as a pedestrian, not on a street. I do not need to walk along the street, I am not a car. Neither are you. 
Thanks, Bob. So, last, last question, Erica, and then we're going to go down so people can get on here. Okay. I'm going to make a comment, I'm afraid, um, because, you know, I think what we need to understand is that we are in an ideal situation right now. When we talk about all these issues, um, we're in an ideal situation if everyone in this room decides they're going to do something about it. We have uh, Christine, and, and that's an ideal situation, who is willing and able to do something on the state level. It will happen if citizens support them. And we could do amazing things if we get behind the good leaders that we have in our district. Uh, the other thing is, you know, a lot of people complain about city council. A lot of people say, that's what else is going on. Well, for those of us who actually attend the meetings, let me tell you what's going on. All the people who are inconvenienced about doing the right thing on climate and environment, those are the ones who came to meetings. Not us. And as long as that continues, we're going to make very little progress. We who care about what's going on with our climate and our environment and our climate, need to become active attendees of the city council. And those of you who do go know exactly what I'm talking about. Things get turned into sound bites. Ideas aren't really looked at. So we can make a decision here today, each and every one of us, that we have a city council that will listen to us if we speak up. We have a great bunch of leaders in our state if we support them. On the Climate Action Bainbridge, that's what we do. And I hope that as many of you who really feel that same commitment will join us. So I, I, I want to thank you. I think we uh, learned from this first one. We need a little more time for questions. Uh, this was our first one. I uh, really appreciate John. Thank you for video viewing this. It's going to be somewhere that will tell you, and, and you can pass it on. But again, I want to really thank the organizing committee and all of you for coming. Um, please advertise this. I think this is going to be a great series uh, in terms of helping to inform people and hopefully to bring them to action. So next, no, next November in a month, we'll have one electrification. And if you have any comments about how we can improve this, um, ideas that you have, we have a website, right, John? That's that and Jane. Um, and, well, Facebook page, yeah, and I'm, I'm the supposed in charge of what we're going to switch off. Um, so um, we'll get back to you on the list. And so if you do have ideas, please tell us because we want ideas on topics. We want ideas on how we run this. And we, more important, we want you to tell your friends and neighbors about this so we get more and more people here. So, again, thank you all for coming and uh, see you next month.